Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan, and I'm a first-year Sloan MBA student. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite to the stage NRG Damas de Rova from the LA-based competitive esports team NRG to present his team's paper on winning duels in Valorant. Damas de Rova. You gotta shake hands. You gotta shake hands. You gotta shake hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am NRG Demars the Rover. Uh, this is a first for esports here on the Sloan Sports Conference stage. So that's why I'm presenting my work uh, under my esports alias. With that said, I need to introduce the rest of my team um, our coach, NRG Josh RT, our players, Android, EU, Hazed, Som, and Tex, and our chief of staff, who just goes by uh, Jamie, Jamie Koenka. Firstly, let's talk about esports. Um, show of hands, how many people have played a video game in their life? Yeah, okay. What about a competitive one where you're going up against another individual in real time? What about one where you're in a team of five and competing another team of five or more in real time? Yeah. And we think there's a place for analytics here in esports. Um, to start, we think it's groundbreaking territory. We've been playing baseball for 146 years. And in the last 20 or so, we suddenly realized that stolen bases don't matter and that stats were lying to us sometimes. In esports, Valorant's only been out for less than two years. We've already used that technology and those learnings to come up with new statistics that better measure player performance, one of which I will share with you today. Even the sports that are esports that are more established, uh, they undergo meta changes, they undergo updates that changes the competitive balance every one of which is an opportunity for new learnings and uh, new, new data. That's something I find really exciting. In addition, in eSports, we have open data access. The NBA is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year, and only in the last nine years did we get robust player tracking data for every match uh, on every court. eSports doesn't have this problem. We exist in a digital world. We have APIs, which allow us to pull information from the match in real time. And we also have demo files, which allow us to recreate every match in history whenever we want, which is really a dream for a data scientist. Lastly, to all the esports fans watching at home, we love our teams. We're very passionate individuals. We're passionate fans. And we have opinions as well, which are often ranted on Twitter. You can have data to support those opinions and get the attention of these pro players and perhaps even help them in their quest to be global champions. You can join a team in North America, Europe, Latin America, Japan, Korea. Um, all these teams around the world competing for one common goal. Let's see who has the best analytics to back it up. So now let's zone in on Valorant. Has anyone heard of Valorant? Uh, young people in the back, hello. Uh, what about League of Legends? That one's more popular, right? Uh, it, those two games are made by the same developer, and they're both committed to growing their esports as large as possible, as an integral part of the game. Valorant is actually most similar to Counter-Strike Global Offensive, or CSGO, as some of you might know. Five people versus other five people in real time, purchasing weapons and strategically, coordinatedly shooting each other round after round after round with a common objective. In Valorant, the difference is that sometimes you have agents that are more combat focused and are naturally a little bit stronger in fighting. You have other agents, which you can play, that are not as combat focused, but more for supporting your team, like the ability to throw a smoke, which will block the line of sight. But these characters aren't as strong when it comes to fighting with their gun. And speaking of guns, they might not always have the best guns because you have a set amount of economy in the game, which you have to invest and share between your players to buy the best gun possible. Now, it's a little tough to read, but just for now, remember that the bigger the gun, the better it is. But the whole point is that sometimes you have the better gun, and sometimes they have the better gun. Not every fight is created equal. Sometimes you'll have the advantage, and our research is to quantify that advantage as best as we can. And we'll get into that. We do so for the pro circuit, of course, looking at the highest level of play. These matches are streamed live on Twitch, YouTube, and other sites. And the data from those matches is directly provided to the internet uh, by Riot Games, the producer of the game themselves. First-hand data in real time, round after round, 
where we can replay the match, we can look at statistics, we know exactly where every player died and every player got a kill. Uh, and that to us is really great because we also scout our opponents. We wanna know what our opponent's gonna do tomorrow and based on their matches today, we could get an analytical report and tomorrow we could be ready to game plan against them. So that's done by a website called runitback.gg. For us, we go one step further. We're not just scouting our opponents, we're scouting for the next best player. Now players right now are evaluated on a stat called kill death average, which is the total number of kills you have divided by the total number of deaths that you have. And we think this is a really bad stat because not all fights are created equal. Like we said, sometimes you have an inherent advantage and if you win those fights, it's not as impressive. We have a new stat called wins above expected, which we'll get into, which tries to address this as best as we can. In addition, if we're able to identify which fights are better than others, we can learn from the model, this is called a Shapley plot, to see why certain fights favor one team rather than another. What factors led to you having that advantage? How can we recreate those factors and help us in the long run? So those are our two overarching goals for this project. Find talent and also help our talent. Seems quite abstract, so maybe it's time for a little bit of gameplay. Here we're actually looking from the perspective of the enemy. He has a big gun. So he's favored, but he doesn't get to see around the corner, that's just for your viewing pleasure that you get to see through the walls. That's our player, NRG Android, and this round he doesn't have a big gun. He just has a dinky little pistol. And he's also running out of time, 25 seconds to make something happen, so let's see what happens. Unfortunately, we don't have sound, so I'm gonna recreate the voice, bang. <laughs> Boom. Wow, what a shot, Brad. Great job, Brad, you're insane. That's what Valorant's like. And those are two very difficult shots. He didn't have the better gun, and he still managed to win the round for us. Compare that to this clip. Now we're looking from the player's perspective now, and he's now the one with the big gun. He's winning a fight right now. He's gonna win a couple more fights, and then at the end, he's gonna say something, which I'll mimic in his voice. There's a second kill. Here's a third. Nice shots, Tarek, thanks man. I love ecos. So what he's saying here is the word eco, which stands for economy. The economy of the other team is broken right now. They don't have the money to buy these big guns. Remember, you need money in the game to buy these big guns. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that they're using their dinky pistols. So Tarek, getting these kills is actually not very impressive because he was heavily favored on all three of those fights. It's gonna count as three kills towards his overall statistics. So yes, of course he would love them. He just got three more kills. His KDA just went up. But really, we know that the last clip was much more impressive. So to summarize, we want a model that will quantify how difficult a fight is for one side or how much of an advantage they have on the other side. We wanna take the context of the fight into account rather than just treating every kill the same. The inspiration here is actually from the kill death data. We plotted in 2D space, red being all the deaths, green being all the kills. You can see the outlines of the map's geometry on the left. And this is eerily similar to the NBA when we have shot maps. Some places are easier uh, to make shots. Other places, it's, it's less difficult, such as the baseline or in, in corners. And the NBA goes a little further than just looking at plain field goal percentage for twos and threes. They'll actually look at context-dependent field goal percentage. How much time is left on the shot clock? How close is the nearest defender to you? Where are you exactly in 2D space? Where is your closest teammate? All those things influence how likely you are to make a shot, just like how in the game, it influences us on calculating how likely you are to win a fight. We have the same kind of data. The XY position on the map, granted it's a more complicated geometry, we have the guns that you're using and the guns that your enemy is using. We have the amount of health you have left. And our shot clock is the game clock. All these factors influence how difficult a fight is and our job is to measure that as best as we can using some kind of probability. We're not calling a field goal percentage anymore, we're just calling it win percent. Chances of this player winning this fight at this time, at this moment, given the circumstances, and of course we calculate it for every fight in pro play. When we do that calculation, we do separate our data into training and testing based on the tournaments. The game is always evolving, so we'll look at some tournaments as our training data, 
and then we'll validate our models on another tournament. And then the results you're about to see is from the test tournament, the last chance qualifier, one of the most important tournaments in the season. Um, and that is, of course, held withheld data when we build the model. We're predicting a probability. So now we need to calculate Breyer score. Breyer score is like mean squared error, but for probability. It's your predicted probability between 0 and 1 minus the actual outcome, which is a 0 or a 1, 1 if you won, 0 if you lost, squared. So this is how we measure the accuracy of probabilistic predictions. And the three best models we use, we found, we tested a lot more. These are the three best. Uh, we're all random forest models, probably because they take into uh, account categorical data really, really well, such as what gun you had, whether you had armor, um, where are you on the, the playing field. And here, lower Breyer score is better. That means your predicted probabilities were closer to the true outcome. We also made a calibration plot. We see that most of the predictions, per the histogram on the bottom, are within that 50% range, and most fights are indeed a toss-up in the game. But for example, the 2,000 uh, or so fights predicted to be around a 30% win probability. The players really did win 30% of that, around 600 of them. So that shows that our predictions and our probabilities are well calibrated. One technology, a recent advance, that we're taking uh, use of is called hyperplane splits. So these are splits built on top of decision trees. Has anyone heard of decision trees, by the way, or random forests? A decision tree is very similar to humans making decisions. We'll look at one dimension, and we'll say, is the weight greater than 20? And then we'll look at another. Is the height lower than 13? And then we'll make a decision by segregating our data horizontally or vertically. That's what it looks like in 2D space. And that's why when we plot our XG boost model as a heat map, we see a bunch of vertical lines and a bunch of horizontal lines. But that doesn't really reflect the geometry of the map, which has a lot of diagonals. Sometimes we want to split our data using diagonals. And then we can make predictions on one side of the diagonal and another a set of different predictions on the other. So when you use hyperplane splits, you start to see those diagonals, which actually reflect the geometry of the battlefield a lot better. These, models are, these plots are a lot more interpretable. The players all like seeing them more because it really does show the diagonal angles that they're used to fighting. But to make these hyperplane splits, we actually, we actually have to take the decision tree and make it into an optimization problem. In the optimization problem, the vector A, which selects which features, is no longer restricted to just being one. It could be more than one. So now, you're using two features to make a split, and you get these diagonal lines in your geometry. OK, here is another map made with those diagonal lines. We use the hyperplane trees, even though they're slightly less accurate than the XG boost. We like the interpretability of this model. And this model is actually showing the comparison between the Phantom and the Vandal, the two most popular weapons in the game. There have been a lot of arguments about this. But really, we can run simulations and say, hey, if you had a Phantom, what if you had that fight with a Vandal instead? Does your win probability increase? or decrease? And if so, uh, how much? So in the blue areas, the phantom is better. In the red area, the vandal is better. And we show this to the uh, players so that they can better make decisions, just like we said, to develop the players so they can better make decisions and take advantageous fights. Of course, that was our second objective. If you remember, our first objective was to evaluate players. This stat is very similar to football. Expected completion percentage above expected. So completion percentage above expected. You take the predicted probability of winning that fight, and then you take the actual outcome, one or zero, and you subtract the predicted probability. So if you're consistently winning fights that are difficult, like a 0.3 or a 0.4, then your wins above expected will go way up. We average that across an entire season, plot that on the y-axis, and we plot KDA along the x-axis to see that even though certain players have the same kill-death average, some players have a much higher wins above expected. They are fighting more difficult fights to get those kills. And these, in reality, are players that tend to play the support roles, where their agents are naturally not as good as combat. So them being able to achieve that number of kills is actually more impressive than if you always had the better agent and the better gun. And that's what we look at to evaluate talent at NRG. OK. For the live audience that's here, thank you, guys. You can look and learn more about our presentation 
out in the hallway. I want to end this presentation by saying a few words to the esports fans back home. I just want to say that all of us have a dream of becoming a pro Valorant player, but not all of us can actually do it. To be occasionally better versus consistently better on your worst day than someone than another player is way more difficult. So for me, taking a break from playing the game and spending all my time thinking about the game as an analyst was the best decision I ever made. If you like math, you can also be an analyst. If you like thinking about the game, you can also be an analyst. And maybe you'll learn how to code as well. And that can help you pay the bills in other ways. You can make heat maps, just like I did. And maybe one day, we'll see you in the pro scene. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to everybody. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for that. That was an exceptionally clear presentation. Appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I don't really have a question as much as uh, like a uh, suggestion. I want to get your thoughts on um, the, your approach essentially abstracts the competition into a set of 1v1 kind of competitions. If, have you thought about, so I, I talked to my friend last night about the game so I could be a little bit smart about it. It's, it's a 5v5, right, mm -hmm. generally. So that set off alarm bells for me. I'm like, what other sports are five on five? Yeah. And uh, there's basketball, of course, and then there's five skaters in hockey plus the goalie. So have you, have you considered an adjusted plus minus statistic where basically you, you, take, the, you take the game or the round, right? Because you play a sequence of rounds. Mm -hmm. So you take the round as the observation. And each, each round is basically a natural experiment. And the predictors are the presence or absence of all the various players you're considering. And then that basically is a regression. And then you can add in other factors as well, like the guns they have and the character classes they may be. And then the, the outcome of the match, either win or loss, um, basically is, is the supervisory variable. And I think that would, because what I imagine is there's a team element to it where you could get like a two-on-one situation or, or one, one player is good in, in one thing, like d drawing a distraction or throwing a grenade or whatever, right? Um, so that, that's my suggestion. That, that's how I would probably tackle this. That, that's a great idea, yeah. Um, we definitely want to look round by round. We think that's really important. Uh, right now, we're working on something that, given the results at the end of that round, um, we'll try to estimate your chances of winning the game. So if you're up by a couple rounds, maybe you have a good chance of closing it out. But that also depends on you know, how your players are performing, how much money they've saved up from the previous rounds. So that's definitely a, a challenge and a more holistic view that we're excited to dig into. I will also add, I think I'd play this game if you would narrate it. So if you can be on Twitch, I will sign up. Um, you know, I, I really like the spatial maps. I think it was on page 11, 12. Can you talk just a little bit about like decision making and strategies based on these and how, you know, someone that's not maybe as into esports could, could look at this and absorb it quickly? Yeah, for sure. The maps are my favorite part as well. Um, we like showing colors. We, numbers are, are a lot tougher to read. Uh, uh, this map, is this what you're referring to or a couple, this one? Uh, this map is a comparison between two equally priced weapons. So when you're playing the game, uh, you always have to pick which one you want to use. And you can only pick one, because you're not going to buy both of them and, and waste the money. Uh, so in areas in red is if you are planning to play those areas and defend from those locations, you should probably pick the red gun, which is the vandal, because you're more likely to win a fight if you were standing there with the vandal. If you were to play the blue areas, which, as you might notice, are kind of close quarters surrounded by wall, uh, walls, that gun shoots a little bit faster. Um, if you're planning on playing those areas, then you should pick the blue gun. Right? And if you're moving from one area to another, it might be worth dropping the gun that you have, picking up the other gun, knowing that you're about to engage in a longer fight or a shorter fight. So just kind of knowing that some maps favor certain weapons uh, has been really helpful to the players. So uh, first of all, 
Um, so, first of all, very entertaining presentation, very clear. Uh, really, really, thanks for that. Um, I did, uh, a question. Actually, we can stick with the with the heat map for a second. Um, the the way you're measuring performance here is, and I and I I, I get the thought. I like it, which is wins above ex your expected wins, right? Now, of course, there's an element of luck in that too, right? So do you do any calibration to see, like, for instance, is there persistence in that skill? So what you might worry about whenever you do an exercise like that is, am I just selecting players based on, on luck, or is there real skill to winning battles in which you're outmatched? And my guess is it's both, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely both. It's definitely both. Um, actually, we, we believe that kills and deaths themselves are more luck-driven. Um, than actually the predicted probabilities. Uh, because in the game, there is a random element. If you have a certain gun, uh, if you just shoot it, it will kind of go randomly and then give you this, this chance of suddenly getting a kill. And in one match, that kill is kind of all you see because the next round you're using a different gun. Uh, we actually found that our statistic correlates stronger from tournament to tournament than the number of kills you have or the numbers of deaths you have. So that's one way we look at it. Um, and over the long run, uh, the luck does kind of even out um, in terms of winning above expected. It's tough to win those 10% fights consistently. Right, so, so I'm, but I'm wondering, you could probably refine the, your statistic on player performance by introducing some element of predictability at the player level that says, you know, if I see persistence in this, I'm gonna call it skill. Mm -hmm. And if not, I'm gonna call it luck and downweight it in the, in the model, right? Right now, you're probably treating them equally. Yeah, absolutely. Right now, we're treating every player equally. Um, and I think we are thinking about segregating these players into some kind of tier system where the ones that have been consistently performing well uh, over many tournaments will get a boost in their calculations. And in that sense, they have an expectation within them to win more fights. And that would give us more accurate predictions. Yeah, and it goes the other way too, right? Ones mm -hmm. that are ranking too low, yeah. you're going to want to boost up. But the other thing I thought you could do as a performance measure too is looking at this heat map is there's, there's winning fights that you aren't expected to win and some of that is luck. Then there's also picking strategies like whether it's gun choice, whether it's area choice, whether it's combined with your teammates that increase your expected win probability. That's also a skill, right? But you could clearly measure that. And that, my guess is that's a more persistent skill. Um, and that might be a really interesting one to, to look at, right? All you'd have to do is just reweight the expected, the, the choices that they make, right? Now you'd have to map out what other choices they could have made, but. Yeah, absolutely. We want players to take good fights. Um, and we actually have looked into that. Who is consistently taking fights that favor them rather than fights that don't? Um, but we have found that the biggest predictor to winning a fight is uh, the agent you have, which you're kind of stuck with the whole game, and the gun that you buy which is uh, a function of how much money your team has. So we would have to somehow tease out those two parameters and to really look at you know, positional and decision making at that level. That's a great question though. We're, we're really excited to work on that. And then one final question I had, which is everything you're doing at the performance level is at an individual player level. But as you said, as one of the functions, people want to find new teammates or, or create a better team. Um, you could think about, and this sort of relates to, to, to Brian's question about plus minus, think about the marginal contribution to the, right? So it may be that you have a certain kind of player that's already covering you on a certain strategy, but you need a different kind of player. And again, I don't know the game that well, so I'm gonna, my ignorance is going to show up very quickly here. But um, could you think about ways in which you could capture the interactions between different kinds of team members, right? Because some teams may want a certain kind of player more than, more than others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's 100% that's what we're after, actually, because players have different equipment that allows them to do different things in the game. And sometimes you need to support your teammates, and uh, you providing them with that piece of utility makes their job easier uh, to get a kill, for instance. But right now, that is only recorded in their stats um, and their wins above expected. But some of that credit needs to go to the supporting players as well. Um, we feel like they're actually quite undervalued in the kills department for sure, uh, but also in our metric as well. So we need to give them some credit. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, All right, thanks guys.